Hello, my name is Allison Markin Powell. And I'm a literary translator based in New York City. I translate from Japanese into English. And I'm here with Kanako Nishi, who is currently living in Vancouver, British Columbia. And we're so excited to participate in the San Jordi New York City Festival. And first, we're going to do a short, a reading of a short story. It's called Kigurumi. That's the original title in Japanese, and the translation is character costumes. So we're going to read the story and alternate reading. Kanako is going to read a bit in Japanese, and then I will read some in English, and we'll go back and forth. And after that, we'll have a brief conversation, uh, and we'll have uh, Marie Ida, uh, trans an interpreter, who will join us for, uh, for that portion of the event. So, without further ado, we present Kigurumi. Kigurumi ga zutto kowakatta ndesu. Hajimete honmono no Kigurumi ni deatta no wa 5 sai no toki desu. Sore made wa telebi na no de sono sugata o miru dake de shita. Ure no ani futari to issho ni hahawa ni yuuenchi ni tsurete itte moratta ndesu. Chihou no chiisa na yuuenchi de shita ga 一応公式キャラクターみたいなのがいて、牛の姿をしていました。モンタンという名前でした。Character costumes have always scared me. The first time I encountered one in person, I was five years old. Until then, I'd only ever seen them on television. My mother had brought my two older brothers and me to an amusement park. It was just a small local amusement park, though, and their official character was dressed as a cow. The character's name was Montan. Montan waved at my brothers and me, tilting his head and wriggling his body. My oldest brother, who was eight, and my middle brother, who was seven, seemed thrilled. They let Montan pat them and put his arms around them. I had been watching this from a distance. My mother nudged me in the back. See, you two go on now. When I think about it, my sense of foreboding can be traced back to that moment. It's obvious from the fact that, as the youngest brother, I should have been the one most delighted. But instead, there I was, watching from a distance. Clearly, I was frightened by Montan. Montan was just too amped up. No matter how cheerful your personality or how fearless you might be, would you really wave your hands and wriggle your body like that? Or put your arms around someone you've only just met? I'd never seen a grown-up behave that way. Or a child, for that matter. Maybe Montan abided by Montan specific rules. But if that were the case, then to someone like me, who was unaware of any such rules, Montan seemed all the more menacing. Tentatively, I drew closer to Montan, the same as with my brothers. I'm sorry. Tentatively, I drew closer, and Montan, the same as with my brothers, waved his hands and wriggled his body and tried to put his arms around me. I let out a cry and backed away. That's when I saw them. The backs of Montan's hands were a cow pattern, that is to say, black and white patches. But there were a few tears in the fabric, this being a local amusement park, they must not have had much money, and underneath showed through. There, unmistakably, I saw the hands of an, a grown man, an elderly one at that, and evidently those of someone who had known hard labor. Veins stood out on those hands, Dark splotches clearly visible. I don't quite remember how I felt at the time. Most likely shock, and on some level, validation. But the one thing I'm certain of is that this was the moment when my dislike of character costumes, no, my phobia of character costumes, took hold. After that, I even became frightened when I saw them on television. And if I happened to come across one on the street, say in a shopping district, I would run away in fear. The characters were all unvaryingly amped up, excessively so. It seemed as if, in their excitement, they might suddenly chomp down on a child's head or recklessly shove one of us through a store window. And even after doing that, they would no doubt still be romping around. I was a gloomy boy. I grew up, grew up to be a gloomy man. I simply did not possess any such frivolity, none of their audacity. 
I was afraid of people and I was afraid of the world. At some point, when was it? I started to wonder what it would be like to be inside a character costume. For all of my terror, something about them also fascinated me. If I were to be inside one, perhaps even a gloomy fellow like me would be capable of frivolity. I might be able to feel relaxed and friendly with people I've just met. It could make me audacious, or so I thought. Sure enough, that's what happened. When I got inside a character costume, I was able to forget about all of those feelings. My vision narrowed, and just when I started to feel suffocated, the next moment I was transformed. I was still me, and yet I was no longer the same person. I became me, so to speak, now with quotation marks. I had bought a mail order cow co character costume. Anything else wouldn't do, I figured. It had black and white patches, but was a bit slimmer than Montan and looked more bovine like. People on the street, they all looked at me. I could do anything at all, like jumping up and down, waving my hands around, high fiving with people I'd just met. At the behest of no one, I went out every day to interact with anyone and everyone. Those were happy days. But then I went and did it. On that day, I was in a park that had a fountain. There were benches around the fountain where couples and elderly people were sitting, and families had spread out picnic sheets on the grass and were relaxing. Everyone was paying attention to me. I was enjoying myself, just had been the, as had been the case up until then. Except that day, something different happened. A little boy yelled out, he stinks. He was a fearless boy about 10 years old. And in fact, I, who was unschooled in the way of laundering, did stink a little bit. I mimicked the gesture that Montan had made, as if to say, oh dear, I brought my hands to my mouth, I tilted my head, that gesture. But at that moment, I recalled how the old man's hands had been visible through the rips in the character costume, and how the backs of those hands had seemed to epitomize the man's miserable life. Fear coursed through my body, which spurred me into a run. And without hesitation, I jumped straight into the fountain. Had I been my normal self, that is, had I been me, I never would have done something like that. But the me wearing a character costume was always more audacious than I ever was. In the end, I was arrested by the police. I was treated like a pervert, and the character costume was kept confiscated too. Having lost those quotation marks, I withdrew from the world for a while. I was too afraid to go outside. Many times, I came close to ordering another character costume over the internet, but each time I stopped myself. I had lost faith in the version of myself inside the quotation marks, and in that frivolity and audacity too. One way of seeing it was that my fear toward character costumes had been proven right. Rather than looking at character costumes online, I searched instead for all of the everyday items I could acquire, regardless of any intention of actually buying these things. This behavior allowed me to fool myself about my hunger for a character costume. Those were indescribably painful days. It was during that time that I found a book. Written in big letters on a white cover were the words, let go of yourself. I felt a faint quiver in my chest. Wasn't this what I wanted? Through all my gloom, I had hated my cowardly self. Just being myself, I was terrified of the world. I couldn't face it. But it seemed that maybe the thing that stood in my way was none other than me. The book was about meditation. It said that our bodies were a kind of container for ourselves, not unlike the quotation marks of my character costume. But letting go of the core of ourselves, our ego, we entrust these containers in their pure form to the world. And the book went on about how much peace can be brought about by doing so, 
with the end result being the ability to love yourself. I decided to take action. I entered a Zen Buddhist monastery deep in the mountains and began practicing Zazen. The ultimate objective of meditation is spiritual awakening. That is to say, achieving enlightenment. I devoted myself to ascetic training. Generally speaking, my practice went well. When I managed to meditate very deeply, the core of myself seemed to dissolve, and I had the illusion that I was merging with the natural world that surrounded me. I became merely a container, like those simple quotation marks from my past. That pleasure was distinct from anything I had ever experienced. I no longer had any need for character costumes. So long as there was a time for meditation, even the world that had so frightened me was now nothing more than a friendly place with which to merge my being. My body simply existed within that world. But then my state of mind was destroyed when the new high priest arrived at the temple. According to this priest, my method was utterly wrong. Experiencing pleasure was unheard of, he said, not to mention that sitting Zazen with an objective in mind was itself heresy in the first place. He showed me some drawings, the ten bulls they were called. He scolded me for not knowing about these drawings. For someone to have gone about entering a monastery and yet be unfamiliar with the ten bulls was an affront to faith, he said. The ten bulls is a series of drawings that depict a way of achieving enlightenment. There is also an accompanying story of a human being and a bull. In the first image, the bull is dark in color. That is said to represent the mind of the human, and the story begins with the person searching for the bull. In the second image, the person discovers hoof prints. In the third, a part of the bull is perceived. In the fourth, the person catches the bull, and in the fifth, the bull is tamed. At that point, the bull's color changes from dark to white. This is to suggest that the fierce and unmanageable heart of the practitioner has grown tranquil and pliable. In the sixth image, the person is riding the tamed bull home, and in the seventh, the bull itself is forgotten, transcended. The meaning of this is that the bull dwells within the practitioner. In other words, that which the mind seeks can undoubtedly be found within one's own heart. That is one interpretation of achieving enlightenment. As I received this frank and unsparing rebuke, I couldn't help but think, cattle? Again? And of course, I also couldn't help but despair of myself and of my situation. The eighth image is completely blank. There is no bull. There is no person. This is supposed to depict an enlightened state of mind in which one has transcended even the self. You even forget yourself, I asked. Honestly, I had never hoped for such a thing. Certainly, I had yearned to let go of myself. However, by letting go of one thing, I had expected to get something else. I had dreamt of going from my gloomy, cowardly self, who was afraid of the world, to becoming someone who could tolerate the world without a character costume and go about my life freely. But to forget even myself? Wouldn't such a transformation negate the possibility of experiencing my longed-for bliss? As the high priest began to explain the ninth image, I stormed out of the temple, leaving him behind. I ran on, even when I thought I could hear the growls of wild animals. I stumbled and fell down, but still kept running. The temple was high in the mountains. There was no sign of nearing the bottom. The sun set as I ran, and it was soon pitch dark all around me. I had nothing to eat. There was no river and thus no water. And here I was in deep wilderness, most certainly injured. I felt alone in this world, that I was the only one alive, dragging my body around, with no other living beings anywhere close. My physical pain was the only thing that connected me to this world. Every twinge in my knees, every ache from my wounds confirmed that I was still hanging on to this life. So, I was able to get the same the もうどこを怪我しているのかわかりませんでした。やっとの思いで体を仰向けにし、浅い息をしました。秋の初め、夜の山は寒く、じっと動かない僕の体はたちまち冷えてゆきました。死ぬんだ、と思いました。このままここで死ぬんだ。いつか考えていた死の予感とそれは違いました。安らかな気持ちにもならず、恐怖も訪れない代わりに、その予感はただ静かに、厳然としてそこにありました。僕はその静けさを受け入れました。その時
、僕のまぶたに一筋の光が差しました。At last, I tripped on the roots of a large tree and was flung against the ground. My entire body hurt, though I wasn't sure where I was injured. With much effort, I managed to turn myself face up and take some shallow breaths. It was early autumn, and nights on the mountain were cold. My motionless body immediately caught the chill. I was sure I would die. I would die, die right here as I lay. This was different from the death I had previously imagined. My presentiment was simply quiet and undeniably present, without any sense of peace, but also took the place of any fear. I accepted that stillness. Just at that moment, a ray of light pierced my eyelids. Thinking it was the rising sun, I opened my eye. It was so dazzling I couldn't see. I closed my eyes again. Behind my eyelids was pure white, and my frozen body became warm, as if I were immersed in hot water. I could feel my cells tremble and my blood boil. I was keenly aware, just like that, without having done anything, and to an embarrassing extent, that my life had only ever been validated by pain. I got up and started walking again. As I was bathed in light, oddly, I no longer minded the pain in my body. I had ascended the mountain triumphantly now. Fascinated by the weight of my body, even my limping gait, I felt unmistakably alive. And then, before I knew it, I reached the foot of the mountain. The area where I had been wandering had been surprisingly close to the bottom. There was a pasture. Just as I thought to myself, surely I will see cattle. Instead, I found horses. Beautiful gray horses. They were grazing, their tails gracefully swatting away flies as they glanced at me every so often. Not a tear came to my eye. Without waiting to recover from my injuries, I set off on a journey. I brought with me the bare minimum, going wherever my fancy led me. Even now, I'm still traveling the world. I feel a ridiculous love for myself. And yes, I even take those things they call selfies all the time. Thank you. Thank you for writing that story. Yeah, thank you. So,、um, if we're lucky,、mm-hmm. I believe that、uh, Marie Ida will be joining us momentarily on the call. And she's here.、Uh, <laughs> We're lucky to have with us the、yeah. world famous、uh, interpreter <laughs> from Tidying Up with Marie, Kondo, with Marie Kondo. Marie Ida is here with us, and、uh, Marie and I are also、uh, co translating a book called Lady Joker by Kaoru Takamura, which is forthcoming in January 2021 from Soho Crime. <laughs> At,、uh, <laughs> Marie is joining us from LA. So, this is really, we have、uh, three different locations. And、um, I guess now is a good time. I really would love to.、Uh, I want to thank Mar- Marianne Newman for putting together the San Jordi Festival and being able to take it virtually online, basically on the turn of a dime.、Uh, she gets so much credit for everything she's doing. And、um, our hearts go out to. Anyone who is suffering right now, and anyone in New York who is suffering right now. And we're so grateful to everyone on the front line and on the second, second lines, too. So,、uh, but、um, we are going to have a little conversation here about the story, character costumes that we just read. So, I guess、um, my first question for Kanako san is、uh, what was the inspiration for this story? And you managed to weave together a、uh, very specific Japanese phenomenon,、uh, Kigurumi and Hikikomori and Buddhism as well, in some unexpected ways. So, could you tell us a bit about that? Yes. Motomoto, I was thinking about the Kigurumi character costume, and I was thinking about the Kigurumi character costume. もうすごく象徴的なペルソ,ペルソナですよね。自分たちは日々社会に対してペルソナをかぶってるけどそれの最たるものじゃないかっていうことでずっと興味があったのとあとは例えば私はその男女問わず恋愛とか尊敬とかあらゆる感情を持った時にその人になりたいって昔から思うことがあって
もうその人の中に入ってその人の網膜から世界を見たい例えばトニー・モリスもそうでしたしあ,のあらゆる人にな,なってみたいって思うんですねでもその人になったとしたらもうその人なんですよねでも自分がその人の中に入って世界を見ている限りは自分の自分性から逃れられないんだなと思ってそのあどこに行っても私は私でしかないんだっていうこの感覚をペルソナごと自分なんだっていうこの感覚を言葉にできたらと思って書き始めました。So, just like the protagonist of the story, I've always、um, wanted to be inside of a character costume. Um, because then I feel like I could do,、uh, I'd be able to do anything. And the character costume is such a symbolic persona, is how I feel. We all don different personas in our daily lives, but a character costume, I feel, is a symbolic extent of that. And this is a desire that I have, but whenever I find someone to love or respect,、uh, regardless of gender, I can't help but feel a desire to climb inside of their body and see the world through their eyes. And、um, I, I, I essentially want to become that person, many different people,、um, Toni Morrison for one, for example. But I realized that me inside of that person is still me.、Um, I cannot escape myself. So no matter where I go,、um, the fact that I cannot escape my me ness, that persona is always myself. And this is something that I wanted to express through the story. It's amazing. <laughs> Amazing. It's like we say in English,、uh, wherever you go, there you are. <laughs> oh. <laughs> you can't get away.、Mm-hmm. Um, so, since we're participating in this、uh, virtual San Jordi Festival,、um, Kanako san, you've participated in a number of international literary festivals in recent years. So, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your experiences with those and did, whether or not. You know, the real thing going to these far flung places, whether it lived up to your expectations or what was most surprising about them? I was in the last year, New York, Cheltenham, the English Cheltenham, and Bangkok, the Bangkok, and 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 the うん私は作家でもあるんですけど作家のミーハーでもあるので作家がこの小説を書いた作家がいるってそれを間近に見られるっていうことがすごく感動的でした特にこのシチュエーションではそうですよねやっぱりその実態を持ってそこにある人を見るってすごい経験なんですねまず。でもう一つは私は例えば世界的に認知された作家ではないけれども。観客の方たちがものすごく熱心に話を聞いてくださって本当に、うん、知りたいって素直に思ってくださってるのが嬉しかったですその景色を見てる限りは小説や表現っていうのは絶対なくならないなっていうのを確信できる景色でした。So, last year alone,、um, I had the opportunity to participate in literary festivals in New York,、um, Cheltenham in England, and Bangkok. And we also went to Dubai,、um, Elson and I together. And I'm a writer myself, but I also fangirl over other writers as well. So, to me,、um, physically witnessing authors of the work that I admire is, is so significant of an experience. Just to have their physical presence near me is an amazing experience. And、um, I'm always Thinking about、um, I, how impressed I am by the passionate curiosity of the audience for someone like me,、um, and even beyond、um, prominent writers and just contemporaries as myself,、um, who do not necessarily speak the same language, but to see that scene, their audience is enthusiastic、um, response to even myself was such a great, amazing scene to see. And that experience alone made me see that literature and this expression is everlasting. It definitely is, isn't it?、Uh, so, you recently moved from Tokyo, Japan to Vancouver.、Um, what are your thoughts? This happened just a few months ago before all of this started.、So、what are your thoughts and impressions about living in Canada, North America, and how has being there affected you as a writer or as an artist?、Mm-hmm. 
とにかく東京が大好きで友達もたくさんいるしすごくエキサイティングな街ででももう本当に私にとってエキサイティングすぎたというか楽しすぎてこう小説を書くこと以外にしたいことが多すぎたんですね。で40歳を過ぎてバンクーバーって本当に未知の土地だったのでまずその40歳を過ぎて未知の土地に行くっていうことその行為そのものがもう単純化されていく童貞というか例えばその荷物も厳選して詰めないといけないし見知らぬ土地だから人もわからない何もわからない状態と,とにかくシンプルになったんですね。でそうした時に自分が何を書きたいのか。そもそも書きたいという思いが続いてるのかっていうのを知りたかった、うん、で結果こっちに来て5ヶ月ぐらい経つんですけどすごく書きたいし書きたいものがもっとクリアになった気がします、うん、で,でもバンクーバーがもしこれからまたすごく自分にとってエキサイティングになりすぎたらまた違うところに移動しようかなっていうのはちょっと考えてます So I'm from Tokyo, and Tokyo is a city I love. I have so many friends there, and it's such an exciting place. Almost a little too exciting for me, perhaps, too much fun. There, I had so many things I wanted to do、um, beyond writing. So, in a sense, it was very、uh, distracting in a way. And after I turned 30,、um, Vancouver loomed over me as this very mysterious, strange place that I didn't know about. And when this, this opportunity to move there、um, came upon my life,、um, I really had to consider. What I would pack even to go there. It was a place that I had no idea about. I didn't know anyone there. So a lot of、uh, what I did and what I was thinking about became simplified and, and clarified.、Um, there in Vancouver, I was able to consider whether I still wanted to write and what exactly was it that I wanted to write about. And it's been about five months since I moved here. And I've come to the conclusion that I most definitely want to continue writing. And what I, the, the type of things that I want to write became、um, all the more clear. But at the same time,、um, this also means that if Vancouver ever becomes too much, too exciting for me, perhaps there's a chance that I would move somewhere else again. <laughs> Just try on another character costume, perhaps. <laughs>、um. So,、uh, going back to where we are today, it's impossible not to talk about the coronavirus and the crisis that it is happening all over the world. And、um, I mean, after we have accounted for and grieved the many forms of loss and begun to recover from all of this or from any of it, I'm curious about, I myself am curious about the kinds of art, the different forms,、uh, literature, film, music. That's going to emerge as a result of this global communal experience. And、um, do you have any ideas about the effect it might have either on your own work or on other, other forms of art? すごくその表現者が全ての表現者がそうだと思うんですけど何よりもまずその無力感を感じてると思うんですね。自分たちの表現がが例えば人工呼吸器にはなりえないし自分たちの言葉私たちが自分たちの言葉がワクチンになるわけでもないその物理的に誰かを助けるっていうことが一切できないっていうことを改めて突きつけられている毎日だと思うんですでもそれは私が 3.11 日本で大きな地震があった後にも体験したことであの時もすごく無力で無力感を感じてただはたはたと気づいたんですけど私たちはずっと無力だった私たちはずっと誰かの命なんか助けてこなかったって一度もそれはすごく感じてでただ例えばその物理的な命の危険にはなくてももう今日のこの夜つらすぎてつらすぎてもう夜を乗り越えられないかもしれないっていう人のそばにいいるる冊を書,ける書くことができるかもしれない本当にだからそれはビビたる力だと思うんです全然大きな力ではないし何かを劇的に変える力も持っていないけど私はそのわずかさそのビビたる小さな力こそが大切やと思っていてきっと今ってその世界中で誰か一人の人やすごく少数の人が莫大な絶大な力を持つことの怖さっていうものをみんなが感じてると思うんですね
そんな中で表現者は自分たちの小さな力をただ誠実に自分の作品に使うべきやなっていうのを改めて思ってる毎日ですだからすごく書きたいなっていうのは思います。I believe that、um, every person, any person that chooses to express something with their lives feel this way right now and what we're feeling is powerlessness. Um, our work cannot be turned into a ventilator. It cannot be a vaccine. It cannot physically help anyone. And we are confronting this reality, this powerlessness every day. But at the same time, this is something that I also experienced、um, back in the post 3 11 world,、um, it's the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake and tsunami. And I also felt that powerless then. But then I realized something and back then, and it was this realization that we've always been this way. We've always been incapable of physically save, helping anyone or saving any lives. And I know that even if someone out there who is not under physical threat, but they feel so, so in despair that they feel that they can't even get through this single night, the literature and work of art can be beside them throughout the night, keep them company. And I feel that this is a very negligible, negligible, trivial amount of power, but this small, trivial power has its importance.、Um, right now, I think we are fully experiencing a time、um, when we're really understanding the danger of one person or one entity building an enormous amount of power. And I do feel that there is,、um, as an author myself, I feel there is this, I feel the significance of writers all over the world having a small power and using that to. to As catalyst of our work. It's a great place for us to end on. I want to thank both Hanako Nishi、mm. and Riida for taking the time to make this recording for the San Jordi event.、Um, I forgot, of course, to mention that the story we read, Kigurumi, was published、uh, in bilingual format in a In Japan last year. The magazine is called Subsequence. It's a beautiful, bespoke magazine. It's a large format and it's hand sewn binding. And、um, the、uh, site where it can be purchased is、uh, available on the St. Jordi site. And、um, thank you again to Marie for such graceful and gracious interpreting. Yeah, thank you so much. Pleasure. Everyone enjoy the festival. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.